All right, that being said, uh, let's dive into a new message series. I hope you've enjoyed our last month of prayer and the prayer course. Uh, I'm really excited about it. As you know, in the email that I sent, uh, there's a follow-up course that will be online in uh, um, February 17th, which is also Ash Wednesday, sort of the start of the fasting period towards Easter, uh, where you can dive into um, unanswered prayer. Um, but I thought a good follow-up for us now, uh, after this prayer course, is to talk about purification. And so I called this sermon series, A Time to Purify. Why is this a time to fear purify? Why do I believe this is a time to purify? You know, I believe God is about to bring a, uh, to bring a renewal uh, of some sort. I don't know exactly what or how, but I believe that any crisis will lead into a time of renewal. And I also know that every renewal kind of starts with a time of purification. If you study any revival type of move in, in, in church history, that always started with a, a purification of the church. And I think uh, in, you, you can't work your way into a revival or anything like that, or even a renewal. Um, but I think to now that we're looking towards the future, now that we're preparing to relaunch as a church, I think it's so important that we take this time now to look at purification. What are some things in our lives that need to be purified? You know, any time of, of upset, any time of isolation can really lead to some unholy patterns. And I don't know what that is for you. Maybe there's, you know... Um, things that you started doing or saying or looking at or listening to that just weren't healthy. Um, some of these things slip in when you're all by yourself. You know, we were most vulnerable when we're in isolation. And so I think it's now good to um, take this time, take this month for purification, to, to just work with our terminology and look at our own lives and see, Lord, where do you want to purify us again and not in response to guilt i don't think our church is like guilty of any major sins at this point it is not that i know um so it's not a source of oh we're guilty we need to purify ourselves no it's a purification as a response to a calling god wants us to be pure he's not looking at, at us and and seeing all the dirt he, he looks at us seeing the potential of of holiness and he's he's calling us to a new place and i think that starts with purification. God is calling us through purification to prepare us for what is coming next. Joshua said it uh, in this way, before they were, the people were about to cross the Jordan River to the promised land, he said, purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And I think that's the phase that we're in now. Purify yourselves because tomorrow or you know, next month or in, a, in half a year when things turn normal again or whenever that will be, the Lord is going to do amazing things. The Lord is going to do something new and we need to get ready for that. And so we're going to study several um, passages in the Bible that have to do with purification. And we're starting now uh, in Second Chronicles 29 uh, where King Hezekiah, king of Judah, uh, initiates a time of purification. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of context for this. Hezekiah became king uh, of Judah when he was aged 25. And it was a dark and desperate time in Judah. I don't know how much you know about the Bible, uh, but after King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel in, settled in the promised land, uh, they split um, his... Uh, uh, there was a kingdom of the north that was called Israel, and there was a kingdom of the south that was called Judah. And the kingdom of the south sort of kind of stayed true to God uh, through it all. The kingdom of the north really not. All of their kings were said to be uh, not pleasing in the Lord's sight. And at this point, when Hezekiah became king, uh, the kingdom of the, actually during his reign, the kingdom of the north, Israel, was overpowered by the Assyrians, and they, um, like... 
they didn't leave a stone unturned, so to say. Like they destroyed Samaria. They took most of their people captive, spread them all over the world. Uh, there was no more kingdom of Israel after all of this happened. And this was prophecy fulfilled. Many prophets had been warning the kings of Israel and the people of Israel that they were turning away from the Lord, turning to idol worship, turning to all kinds of injustice. And, and, and they said... The Lord will not permit you to do this. You are breaking the covenant over and over and over again. He will bring about destruction. And finally it happened. Now Judah somewhat stayed true to God. But there were times um, kind of back and forth where kings also started uh, going in the ways of the kings of Israel. And they uh, also turned to idol worship. Hezekiah's dad was King Ahaz. And he was one of those kings that led the people astray. He led them to idol worship, even to the point of, of probably sacrificing some of his sons in fire. Like, can you imagine? And he even closed the temple, the center of the worship of, of Yahweh, the God of, uh, the God of Israel, the God of Judah. He closed the temple down for worship. This is a full-on rejection of the Lord, their God, as it, uh, uh, of the Lord as, as their God. Yet, when Hezekiah became king, he turned all of that around. The uh, Assyrians also came knocking on their gates. Actually, one of their messengers stood up on their wall, threatening them. You know, none of the gods of all these peoples that we destroyed were able to save them. Who do you think Yahweh is that he can save you? Don't believe Hezekiah. It was a big threat. But in the end, they were able to avert this and imminent destruction because they turned back to Yahweh. And we're now going to study how they turned back to Yahweh as the God of Israel uh, through this time of purification. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to start in uh, verse 1, reading up to verse 11. We're going to do a lot of Bible reading today. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Second Chronicles 29. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became the king of, of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was uh, Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. Quick pause. How did, how did Hezekiah, as the son of this wicked king Ahaz, return, like, like immediately um, lead the people to return to Yahweh? It's very probable that his mother all this time stayed true to Yahweh. It's very probable that his mother taught him not to go in the ways of his father. And so that's an encouragement to any mother out there that is struggling at home. Maybe your, your um, husband is not a believer or anything like that. But you have a, such a, a, a powerful influence for your children. Hey, so in the very first month, of the first year of his reign, this is significant, in the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and Levites to meet him at the courtyard east of the temple, and he said to them, Listen to me, you Levites, purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord and his dwelling place. They turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the temple's entry room and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting uh, burnt offerings at the sanctuary of the God of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread, horror, and ridicule, as you can see with your own eyes. Because of this, our fathers have been killed in battle, and our sons and daughters and wives have been captured. But now I will make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. We'll pick it up later again in this uh, chapter. What I love is that it says, the first month of the first year of his reign. In other words, the very first bill that he signed was 
let's reopen the temple again. Like as soon as he became president, as soon as he became king, he's like, the time of my father has stopped. A new time has come. We were turning to Yahweh. There was no time to waste. He knew that the danger that they were facing was because of their unbelief, was because of their uh, them being untrue to the covenant uh, that the Lord had um, um, made with them. And he said, we need to return back to our God. He's the only one that can save us from the destruction that's coming from the Assyrians. See, when, the stri- uh, when disaster strikes and when there's an upset, it is time to return to the Lord. You know, sometimes God will bring you to the end of yourself in order to bring you back to himself. You know, maybe this is something that you've experienced personally as well in this, in this last, you know, whole year. It's almost coming up to a year that we're in this mess. Unbelievable. You maybe fear that has always been hiding beneath the surface, like became a very dominant um, emotion for you this year. Maybe anger that's been rising to the surface. Maybe you've slipped into some unholy habits in in your eating, in your listening, in what you're watching, in what you're doing, what you're saying. Maybe you became so stressed out and so busy uh, that experiencing God's peace is, is a distant memory. It could be that loneliness of lockdown and isolation slipped you into uh, a light or strong depression. All of these things do not come from God. But I believe that God will use anything to bring you back to himself. He wants you to come close to him. He, he will use anything in your life, any trial, any difficulty, any of, any of these even unholy things to help you to understand that you need him more than anything in this world. A crisis will bring everything that's hiding beneath the surface up and it will become dominant. And I think that's what we're seeing even in our country, you know, good old Netherlands that's rioting in the streets because of the, the curfew. Unbelievable. Everything, all of these things are, are, have always been hiding beneath the surface and are now coming up. Maybe for your own life, things have been coming up this year that, that you didn't know were there and they're, they're, they're unholy. They're not supposed to be there. It's a time for purification. Again, not out of guilt, but out of calling. God is calling you back to himself. He is calling you to purify your life and to rededicate it to him. And so what follows in the passage that we're studying is that there's a list of 10 people assigned with the job to purify the temple. And it says this, these men called together um, their fellow Levites and they all purified themselves. Then they began to cleanse the temple of the Lord just as the king had commanded. They were careful to follow all the Lord's instructions in their work. The priest went uh, into the sanctuary of the temple of the Lord to cleanse it. And they took out the temple courtyard and the the defiled things that they found. From there, the Levites carted it all out to the Kidron Valley. This is where they destroyed all the idols and all the unholy stuff. They're like, like, throw it in the valley. And they began to uh, do the work in early spring on the first day of the new year. That's significant, right? The first day of the new year. It's incredible. In that time, it was springtime. Um, And in eight days, they had reached the entry room of the Lord's temple. Then they purified the temple of the Lord itself, which took another eight days. So the entire task was completed in 16 days. No time to waste. There's two things I want to highlight just from this passage. The first one is that the people who were assigned with the task to purify the temple first had to purify themselves. And I think that's very significant. You know, we all know the saying, a, a, a better world starts with you. And I think that this, this is like how we can see this purification as well. You know, they had to start with purifying themselves before they could purify the temple. And this is true for us as well. Like, if you want to see communication improved in your home, then start with asking God to 
cleanse your communication and make it holy. Point out anything that's, that's unholy in the way that you do things before you sort of set about on that mission to, um, make, to improve that in your house. Um, if you're part of a group of friends and you want it to be gossip-free, then ask God to, to purify your hearts toward them and your words towards them. Let it start with you. If you'd like to see anything change or improve in our church, then first ask God to completely purify that part in your life where you want to see a change, where you want to see an improvement. Only purified people can purify places. Any change for the good of God's kingdom around you needs to begin with the kingdom consuming every part that is not under the reign of Jesus within you. It starts within you. But second thing that, that I just want to highlight from the passage we just read is that they were careful to follow the Lord's instructions. It says it specifically. They were careful to follow the Lord's instructions when they purified the temple. You know that God's standard for what is pure is very different from our standard. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Leviticus. Uh, if you're doing a Bible in one year, Leviticus, together with Job and Ezekiel, is just some of the hardest Bible stuff to get through. Uh, you know, when you come to Chronicles, you can skip over some of those lists, you know, cheat a little bit. Leviticus, it's, it's, it's a lot of words, and it's a lot of technical details on things that seem so irrelevant. You know, why all this you know, hassle to make things clean and pure so that you can slaughter an animal and put it on the altar. Why? You know, it's, it's, you know, when I read it, it feels super unnecessary. The thing is, you and I, we read a book like Leviticus, which they used, you know, th that's where they found their instructions. Um, we see it as irrelevant, but we read it through the eyes of the New Testament, where we know that the, the perfect sacrifice is, of course, Jesus Christ and all of that stuff is in that sense um, we can now read it in a, in a different way, in a different light, more principles. We, we don't have to go through all of that to get to God or to find forgiveness. We, we have that in Jesus Christ, the, the, the perfect sacrifice. And we understand now that true purification is not happening externally but more internally. But my point is here that from the book of Leviticus, we learn that God's standard of what is pure far exceeds, exceeds what we consider to be pure. It's a bit like when my wife and I are cleaning the house. Her standard for what is clean is different from my standard for what is clean. And for this reason, you know, purification really is an ongoing thing, right? Um, and... and the example of purification that we're studying today um, is more like a short-term, intensive focus project. You know, with cleaning, like, you know the term spring cleaning, how, how once a year or twice a year you, you take a Saturday, you turn the whole house upside down and you clean everything, every little corner, every shelf, every dusty, dirty, stickle, li sticky little place, like you make that clean. Uh, actually, today I was um, taking out a car seat we've been using for Bente for, uh, for three years. I took it out, it was... It was and I took out of the cover, and beneath the cover, it was so dirty. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, how did we sit our little baby down in this for so uh, such a long time? You know, there's stuff hiding beneath the surface. When you do a spring cleaning, you clean all of that. And that's, I think, what we're being called to here. Of course, I mean, we have our day-to-day -day cleaning. I mean, you clean your bathroom regularly, hopefully, uh, you do your vacuum cleaning, you do your dishes, you do your dusting, I don't know, students, but, uh, you know, when you grow up, you will also learn that you'll need to do some dusting and stuff like that. That's the day-to-day -day cleaning. I think God is now calling us to a time of purification when we turn everything upside down. And say, Lord, show us any dirty, stickle little corner where we need to really scrub the dirt away and the dust and the stickiness. Show us any hidden place in our life, anything that's, that's happening beneath the surface where purification is needed. And of course, 
purification, sanctification is something that continually happens. But every now and again, we need a good spring cleaning. Something else I want to highlight here is that purification is something, that it's, it's about the heart. You know how the Pharisees in the New Testament had their whole acts, like, like, this, like it seemed so clean. Jesus even compared them to gravestones that were shining in the sun, like freshly painted, but a gravestone is still a gravestone and underneath there's these rotten bones and our lives shouldn't be like that, where, where everyone thinks of us as super holy, uh, but actually our heart is uh, corrupted, you know. God's concern goes much deeper. He looks at our heart. He wants to deal with the underlying issues in our hearts, the the unhealthy patterns, the unholy attitudes, the misleading thoughts that are corrupting our lives. And he says, now is the time to let God come with this purifying fire and consume everything that is not from him. I'm asking you this month to to lean in, to to pray some dangerous prayers, to ask God to to guide you through a time of intense purification of all your motives, of all your patterns of thinking, of all the things that you do and the things that you don't do. Okay, last part of the chapter in um, 2 Chronicles 29 I want to focus on is how they are rededicating the temple. So now the people have purified themselves and they've purified the temple and now it's time to rededicate the temple. And they do that through worship. They do it through worship. Let's read. King Hezekiah then stationed the Levites at the temple of the Lord with cymbals and lyres and harps. Um, He obeyed all the commands that the Lord had given to King David through uh, Gad the seer. And the Sorry, King Seir and the prophet Nathan. The Levites then took their position around the temple with the instruments of David, and the priests took their position with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah offered, uh, ordered that the burnt offerings be placed on the altar. As the burnt offerings uh, offering was presented, songs of praise to the Lord were begun, accompanied by trumpets and other instruments of David, a former king of Israel. The entire assembly worshipped the Lord as the singers sang and the trumpets blew until all the burnt offerings were finished. Then the king and everyone with him bowed down in worship. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the psalms written by David and by Asaph the seer. And so they offered joyous praise and bowed down in worship. So before... Hezekiah and the priests and the Levites were able to to lead the people back to the Lord. They first had to purify themselves, then they had to purify the house of the Lord, and then they had to bow down in worship to God. And I believe that this is a a pattern that that we uh, as a church can can follow as well. I would like to see God do a, a mighty thing in and through our church. Use us to to bring people back to himself. Be a blessing to the city. And so we first need to purify ourselves. Then we need to purify our house. And then return to God in worship. First purify yourself. Ask God this month to do a spring cleaning in your life. To leave no stone unturned. And to not stop until every sticky little corner is clean. Take some time this week to evaluate your life to pray some dangerous prayers, and to deal with any unholy patterns and habits that um, start happening this year and discern where purification is needed. I also want to give you a daily exercise. That's the examine prayer. It's also found in the the prayer course. If you go to the the tool shed of the prayer course website, you'll find the examine prayer there. It's something I do nearly every night. It's five minutes where I just pray, God, Where did I see you today? Where did I miss you today? And where did I resist you today? And it helps you to evaluate your day together with God and um, kind of deal with that. Ask forgiveness where you need forgiveness and prepare your heart for the next day. Secondly, purify your house. Now, I'd like to apply this in two different ways. First, 
uh, your own household. Of course, you spent a lot of time at home and with our family. And some of you have really taken this opportunity to, to invest time in, in your family. I think it's a great, uh, great thing. Um, and so lead your household as well in the time of spring clean, cleaning, a time of spiritual uh, spring cleaning. And secondly, I believe that this applies to our church. And I want to invite you this month to pray with me uh, and with our team as we're discussing how to continue on from here because it's a challenging time and we want to look forward to the future and what God is doing and how we are navigating now through the next couple of months. And um, we want to work towards a relaunch of the church. My deepest prayer is that we'll come out of this whole crisis um, with more faith, with more vision, with more purpose, like stronger than ever. And I pray that in a couple of years when we look back on the corona crisis, we'll be thankful for it. We'll know that this was not just a disruption, a interruption, it was a disruption. Some things had to, had to change, some things had to be renewed. That It wasn't a delay of God's purpose for us, but more it was launching us into a new purpose for us. A time of revisioning and recentering on God's calling and purpose for this church. That's my prayer, and I want to invite you to pray that with me. Let's let's clean up our house in the coming months, preparing for what is to come. And lastly, return to worship. The last step of the process, uh, before all the people could could come in, was it needed to be filled with worship to the Lord. The temple was rededicated through worship. And the worship that we read about is both this explosing, uh, like a explosion of praise, but also this reverent humbling before God, this, this consecration. Man, I've, I've, I've missed worshiping with all of you in one place, like out loud. Um, and I look forward to the day when we can do that again. But even though we've not being able to do that. That doesn't take away our opportunity to worship, nor does it take away our calling and our, our longing to worship our God. And I believe that God is looking for a people that doesn't need a band or a church service to worship, but that's so full of worship that it's just bursting out of them. Actually, what we're going to do this month is, um, some people have set up um, a form where you can... Uh, share um, what your favorite worship song was this last year and why. Just share a little bit of a testimony with that and an encouragement. Um, the link is actually seen just below um, our, our YouTube uh, link. So if you're on our YouTube channel, you can, you can follow a link there, Google Form, fill that in. And then we're collecting a playlist on YouTube and on Spotify uh, with all of our favorite songs uh, from this year, with some stories around that. So we're, we're making sort of, yeah, like a worship collaboration uh, together. I want to invite you to, to do that and to think about that. What has been a song that really spoke to me this year? You know, I believe God is looking for people that will worship with great celebration, but also now knows how to bow down in, in deep reverence before God. I believe that our Lord is looking for people that understands that songs are just one aspect of worship. But true worship is when you put your whole life on the altar saying, here I am, purify me, send me Lord, use me. It's no longer I who live but Christ in me. I want to invite you guys up again, worship team, to lead us in a time of worship. And after that, we'll, we'll celebrate communion. But church, let's, let's return to the heart of worship before we return to congregational worship. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time um, online. And, and I pray that we'll, we'll feel connected in this. Lord, I've taken the bold step to invite our whole church into a time of purification. And I just pray, Lord, that you will begin speaking to us. That we'll enter a time of purification, not out of guilt. Not out of, oh, we're unholy. Oh, we're this. Oh, we're that. Oh, we're not good enough. 
but out of calling. You're calling us to new places. You're calling us not to, not to clean up our act, but you're calling us to, to open up our lives to you so that you can do a, a, a spring cleaning. And so, Lord, we, we dedicate ourselves to you. Purify us now. Purify our motives. Purify our hearts. Purify our words. Purify our actions. Purify our prayers. Purify our homes. Because we know that only purified people can purify places. And we long to see our city return to you. We want to be ready for a time of renewal. We want to be ready for a time of revival. We want to be ready for a new move of God. So purify us now. Preparing us for what you're about to do in our city. In Jesus' name. Amen.